by the grace of Christ, my brethren, we shall read today from the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, chapter 22. So, from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, and verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you have loved, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. <clears throat> then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. <coughs> and Abraham stretched down his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad, or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. <coughs> so Abraham went and took the ram, and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, and the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven, and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. And your seed, all the nations of the earth, shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. <coughs> so Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Amen. Abraham is about 110 years old. 100 years old, his wife gave birth to Isaac. For Isaac's age, we do not know how old he is approximately, but the Word of God says that he is a young child. He is so old that he may lift the wood for the burnt offering on his back, but also so young so that Abraham is able to bind him and put him on the wood for the burnt offering. It is a very crucial day, a critical three days, a critical moment for Abraham. Everything started with Abraham when God called him. God visited him and he told him, Go out of your land and your relatives, and I will lead you to the land which I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, 
and you will always be in blessing. And I promise you, I swear to you, to bless those who bless you and to curse those who curse you. And through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And a calling with great promises. A calling that we'd say is unique. <clears throat> a calling of God toward a man whom his father called Abram, and God renamed it to Abraham, which means father of many nations. Father of a multitude of nations. So from the moment that God called him, and very important, the fact that God called him, but according to my humble opinion, the most important thing is that Abraham accepted God's invitation. <clears throat> because God doesn't work in the life of man only, but He cooperates with man in His life. He works with him. Furthermore, it says, You did not choose me, that is, Abraham did not elect God, but I chose you, Christ says. God chooses us, and He waits to see how we will respond to His choice. And our response to His choice is not a theoretic um, approval and uh, um, acceptance, but it is a whole work of a whole life. That is, the fact that Abraham responded in the beginning at the first calling of God does not mean that everything has come to an end. The fact that today, and here I want us to pay attention to God's message that He wants to give us today. Let us pay attention to it. The fact that today, we responded to God's calling, who told us, come to church, <coughs> and we said with our whole heart, Yes, we're coming, because we could say, oh, I'm not going to come. God doesn't ever take away man's liberty that He has given him, this perfect gift that He has given to man. He never takes away man's liberty. You're always free. But the fact that we responded God's calling today does not mean that the work of God has come to an end in our life or that the work of God continues in our life if we do not continue to respond to God's invitations that are to follow. So that as God hasn't ended here, He will continue to invite us and call us to do other things, to do new things, into special situations into special, special personal discussion with Him, invitation, and even demand from God. God will demand certain things from us. <coughs> and the more we go on walking with Christ, so much more will God's callings in our life be changed into demands slowly, slowly. Why? Because He will begin to trust us. And we will build our trust, God's trust in our life, and God will build His, our trust in His presence. That is, the more we carry on and go and become closer to God, God will come closer to us. <coughs> we shall become more, come more in oneness with God and the Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, and God will become one with us through Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? It means that more and more will God begin to reveal Himself to us. God will reveal Jesus Christ to us. God will reveal the paraclete, the spirit of truth to us, and the most important thing of all, God will reveal ourselves in His presence. 
so that we may understand who we are, so that we may prove who we are in our relationship with God, and so that all the powers of heaven, the powers of angels, even the spirits of wickedness, may they understand who we are. <coughs> and in reality, what God has made us in the end. Because this is God's work. We are God's building. The Apostle Paul points this out and says, I have placed a founding stone which is none other than Christ. But every one of you builds and let him be careful how he builds. He has to build with gold and silver and precious stones. Knowing this, knowing very well that his work will be tested and it will be tested with fire. And if the work isn't built with gold, silver and precious stones, but it is built with wood and rods and sticks and grass, when it will be tested, that it will definitely be tested with fire, it will be consumed. But if it's built in the way that it ought to, in a way that God builds in us, and we build in the presence of God in our life, if this structure is built of gold, silver, and precious stones, then the fire will come. But it will not hurt us. On the contrary, it will make us even more pure. And the gold with which we build will become approved gold through fire. And the silver, the same. The precious stones, the same. And the, the brightness will be greater. And the glory of God in our life, even more apparent and obvious. This is what happened to Abraham and to all men of God. <coughs> From his 75 years, Abraham lived up to his 110 years, approximately. I'd say that, let's say Isaac it was around 10, 9 years old, 12, 11, doesn't matter, 13. Let's say around 10 years old was Isaac. Until his 110 years, he lived a lot of things and he saw God's blessings. He always accepted God's calling. He always responded to God's calling. He made mistakes in his life. Great mistakes. But when God called him to correct himself, he immediately responded, corrected uh, the, the conditions, and God came in and fixed everything in the end. So, all the promises, all the promises of God to Abraham took place. They were fulfilled. So being a hundred years old, and his wife was around ninety years old, barren, without uh, the manner of women, God gave her what he had promised him. A son in whose seed, Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But, something is lacking so that the work of God may be perfect so that the work of God in Abraham's life may be perfect. And so we can understand what this thing means. The Lord still has to do work until He makes His church perfect, holy, spotless, without a wrinkle or, ble or blemish or any of the sort. He has still work to do until He makes her glorious. And then He will take her. So God has worked with Abraham and then he will promise him with oath the perfect blessings that he has for him. But the crucial moment came. The moment came for his, him, him to be tested through fire. And as we said, the response to the invitation and also the response to God's uh, trial has levels. First of all, he says, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, Abraham answers. Take now, now your son. Not whenever you feel like it, but whenever I tell you. 
So take your son now, your only son Isaac, whom you have loved, Isaac, the one that I gave to you, and to whom I promised everything, and go now to the Mount of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. This is a calling of God. Now he needs to respond. And the first response is absolute obedience to the Word of God in our life. <coughs> there is no response of faith. There is no response of trust. And glory to God, if man does not begin with absolute obedience. And even more, so this absolute obedience may begin, Abraham has to contemplate that God who gave him Isaac is able to raise him from the dead even. Because if he doesn't think this, if he doesn't ponder this, that is, if he doesn't make a decision to accept in his heart the death of Isaac, he cannot obey God. And he cannot accept Isaac's death. He cannot make the decision of death unless he trusts the one who raises the dead. The one who raises people from the dead. He is, the moment for Abraham has arrived and he has to prove that he has made the decision to die for God and he doesn't take death into account. Why? Because there is someone who is above death. And that is God who raises the dead. <coughs> and he has made this decision. And because he has this decision, he doesn't hesitate. So contemplating and thinking that the one who promised him Isaac was able, to raise him from, was able to raise him from the dead, even if he puts him to death when he obeys God's word. Having this faith, he continued. He started out. At that moment, he didn't have to pray about it. He didn't have to ask for strength from God. He did not have to prepare himself. He did not have to mourn his son. He did not need to, to, to cry. Why? Because in his heart, he has made a decision to die. And the decision of death, God wants to place this in our heart, either with His gentleness or with His, good, with his strictness. Either through doctrine in the, of the apostles, either through God's interventions that sometimes may be painful in our life. <coughs> Even this man, the apostle Paul, had not made the decision of death. He had not realized this. He had not comprehended it. And God had to take him through a great tribulation that he hadn't lived before in his life. So that he was forced to, to testify and say, I was even um, lost hope in life. Today, I believe this, my dear brethren. I believe it's a crucial day for every one of us. God wants to teach us to make a decision of death for him. Because otherwise, we cannot respond to God's callings, which, as we said, at some moment will become demands. Because if we do not take this course that's ahead of us, by laying in our heart the decision of death, then we will never be ready on that day for the rapture of the church. And Abraham has this decision. That's why he took his son. He saddled up the donkey on that day. And he did exactly what the Lord told him. He started to go up to the Mount Moriah. He took two servants of his with him. And when he reached that place, he left the servants there. He told them to stay there. He told them, you stay here with the donkey. And I with the lad will go yonder and worship. And we'll come back. He put the wood on Isaac's back and they started climbing. And now, my dear brethren, the second characteristic which will lead us to our responding to God's callings and God's demands. <coughs> now, emotion 
comes in. He is alone with a son that he loves. And concerning whom he has received order from God to sacrifice him, to kill him. And his son says, my father, we have taken everything with us. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? But this man is a man of faith, Abraham. He believes this. He doesn't mock him. He says, the Lord will provide my son. The Lord will provide for himself. So they find the place. And they build the altar there. He puts the wood in order. And he binds his heart first. And then he binds Isaac, who due of age would probably resist forcefully. He's a child. It isn't Isaac's work, God's calling for Isaac. It's God's calling for Abraham. So when he binds him, ties him up, he puts him on the altar. And when he puts him on the altar, he lifts up the knife. And God is observing him. <coughs> God is observing his every move. He knows his heart. He knows everything about him. He knows his thoughts. He knows the battles that he's giving with his heart. He knows that the, the battles that he's giving with himself. And we all know what it means. I am fighting with my heart. I am battling myself. It's the most difficult battles. For that reason, the Apostle Paul says, I take my body and bring it into subjection. Because otherwise, I will not be able to be approved that I may enter into the kingdom of heaven if I do not bind my body. How does this man bind his body and tie his son and put him on the altar? What is this? Uh, he, look at this binding of his own body. He brings his body into subjection, his own body. And when he lifts his knife, God comes into the picture. And he reveals to him what he has in his heart. And this thing, God has to give it to us, that we may have it in our heart as well. He says, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the lad, or do anything to him. For now I have known, now I know first of all, that you fear God. And why did I know that you fear God? For you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. A different fear of God here. There was fear of God in Abraham. But this thing that God is revealing to us today is a completely different fear. Which fear of God brings into subjection and binds all the emotions of man. Even the fatherly emotion of the love of a father toward his child. <coughs> because you did not spare your son and you were ready to give him over to me, this way it is proven. Okay, my Lord, but do you not know Abraham's heart? Yes, I know it. But it has to be revealed. My justice has to be revealed that I will justly give him all these great promises because he responded not only with absolute obedience by making a stable decision in his heart and the decision of death. He does not take death into account because he trusts in him who is above death and has overcome death. But he also brings his heart into subjection and he does not spare. He doesn't even spare his only son. What he has is that he fears God. And where does the fear of God lead him? Not terror, but a fear of love, of respect, and obedience. Where does this thing lead him? To him not placing any person in this life above God, His Word, His callings, and His demands. Glory be to God. Let me say this again, because it is this crucial thing. <coughs> Yes, I have made the decision of death for myself. But now, I have to tame my heart and not be sad for anything when it comes into contradiction with the one that I love, respect and fear, God the Father, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. I do not take anything into account before them. 
I do not put any occasion, any person, and any condition of my life above God, whom I respect, fear, and love. And I know <coughs> that what he tells me, is, I don't only believe it, but I know that what he tells me will end up to be for the glory of God, and I want it for the blessing, my blessing, and the glory of God. I trust God that He asks for things that in my heart seem strange, but in reality, He is the one who raises the dead. Because He is the one who raises the dead, He will do great things and marvelous things, and I will participate in them. And I do want to participate in God's glory. Amen, my brethren. We want, I want personally, my family, our church, your church all over the world to partake in the glory of God. But so that it may partake in the glory of God, we have to learn to bring into subjection my heart, my body, our desires, <coughs> our will, and bring it under the Word of God. And so when he turned his eyes left and right, he saw what God had foreseen. And he again, by faith, had prophesied this. He saw this ram, a perfect ram, ready for sacrifice, caught in, in a thicket. He took him and sacrificed him. And for a second time, God speaks to him and tells him, Now the perfect thing comes. My dear brethren, Please listen to me. We are waiting for the perfect thing. And the perfect thing for us is the rapture of the church. It's the fulfillment of God's promises to us. The perfect thing was Abraham, was something surpassed, or something limited, something that is comparable, humanly speaking, with the perfect thing for you. Your perfect thing is to see your body turn into, from incorruptible, for corruptible to incorruptible. And one twinkle of an eye, you'll see it become immortal in one moment. <coughs> so we are approaching our perfection. Perfection is on its way. The Lord is coming. Jesus Christ is coming to take a church that is holy and perfect, to take you who is holy and perfect. Once again, He is coming to take you perfect and glorious in the presence, in His glory, in His kingdom. Do we want this? Well, Lord, we want nothing more. We want nothing else. And when we stand and our vision falls on this perfection, then everything else seems insignificant, small, wretched, and vile. So when he killed the ram, then the Lord told him, <clears throat> spoke to him and said these unique words, I have sworn by myself. Listen to this. Who could ever imagine that God would give an oath to a man, to Abraham? God would give an oath to a man. Here God forbids us to give oaths to one another because we are all liars. And he says, you are all liars. Only God is true. <clears throat> and God who is true doesn't say, Amen, Amen, I say to you, most assuredly I say to you, but he says, I swear to you. And because there is nothing greater than this for him to swear, he says, I swear to myself. I am the greatest. And what are you saying here, Lord? What are these new things that you are making, that you are saying here? Yes, new things indeed. I am swearing by myself that in blessing I will bless you. Multiplying I will multiply your descendants. Your descendants will possess the gate of their enemies in your seed. All nations of the earth shall be blessed because after all these things you still obeyed my voice. <coughs> and this is the third characteristic, my dear brethren of the absolute trust of God and man, Abraham. 
I'd like to ask you here. I'd like to ask the Lord here. Lord, do you have any trust in me? What do you say? What will God answer? I tell him, where can you find trust in me, Lord? But here we find a man, my dear brethren. Here we see a man that God trusts completely. God trusts him completely. And you know, my dear brethren, you know whom God will take with him? The ones that he trusts completely, so that the, when they are in heaven, they will not produce problems in him, like the overshadowing cherub created problems for him, who became an angel, Satan, the devil. God wants to make us reach this point where he may have absolute and perfect trust in us, so that he may swear to us not only with word like he did to Abraham but with work through our transformation he'll say I transform you I make you like the risen Christ and give you his body because I absolutely trust you I trust you I trust that you will be able forever and ever to reign So, if I cannot say, neither to myself nor to any one of you, that I am reliable in the eyes of God, then what do I testify and confess? That I am not ready for the rapture of the church. But at the same time, I confess that Christ is working. As the Lord said, my Father works, I work, and the paraclete works in our life, so that He may make us worthy of absolute truth before God. That is why He sent Christ. That is why Christ teaches us. That is why God doesn't trust any anyone, anyone else to teach us except Christ. That's why God doesn't trust anyone else to lead us except Christ. God trusts no one else. That is why God trusts no one else to lead us and govern us except the Helper, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Ghost. Because only Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit can lead us to being in His absolute trust at that moment, at that second, at that hour when the Lord will come to take us. <coughs> and we today are asking for revival, amen? But it's better for us to ask, my dear brethren, for God to make us reliable but He cannot make us reliable except if we find grace before His eyes. And we cannot find grace before His eyes unless we have a spirit of a humble person, a contrite heart, and we tremble at the Word of God. And we cannot have a spirit of a humble person, a contrite heart, and tremble before His Word unless Jesus Christ Himself doesn't come by grace to give us all these things. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.